this episode is with William Allen. We spoke about alpha men, omega men, um, beta men, <laughs> and how parents can help uh, their sensitive sons and so much more. I will read his bio aloud. So William Allen is a uh, first time author with a writer's heart and researcher's mind. Wonderful combination, right? After getting a degree in psychology with an eye on psychology research, he recalibrated for a career in information technology, the IT. Allen found himself in a 30 year career as an information technology manager at Wells Fargo, who enjoyed managing highly intelligent, often difficult staff, many of whom were highly sensitive. He retired early from his corporate job to find his hypno-coaching and neurofeedback brain training business. Brain Pilots in Bend, Oregon. While in Bend, he co-organized the area's first introvert, highly sensitive person discussion group. And in late 2016, he began his blog, The Sensitive Man about his experiences as a highly sensitive man. The blog became the genesis of his book. It's a wonderful book. Please read it, The Confessions of a Sensitive Man. He feels that HSP males need to take their keen insights and intuition and make them public. He would like to shed more light on highly sensitive males and a much needed role they need to take in our society and also for highly sensitive boys. Enjoy, here's William Allen. That's, yeah, that is, that is me. That was a happy picture. Yeah, I can still see it's William. It's yeah. sparking your eyes and right. Yeah. Well, like I said, when I was a kid, that was a Billy, and it was this is my little Billy shot, you know, mm -hmm. uh, me as a young man. But that really is a good shot of what I think. If I were to look back now and say, you know, I was a sensitive boy, that was probably the shot that I think would have expressed that the best. So, I, you know, it's funny. I, I spent a lot of time playing in my room by myself. I had, I grew up with three sisters. All of them were younger than me. I was the oldest. And I liked to play. I had these little toy soldiers and stuff. And I would, I would uh, play with them in the room and I would make up little scenes, you know, like a movie scene where they would talk to each other and they would do things together. Um, and I would orchestrate it like a director would, you know, for a movie. And I would um, have fun, get in, into my own fantasies and my own ideals and, and so forth about ex expressing that through those soldiers. It was a lot of fun. I had a lot of friends, and you know, that uh, probably weren't HSP boys. They would take them out, line them up, get a BB gun and shoot them, right? And I just never thought that was very cool thing to do but I like playing with it because it was a way of expressing myself through these these characters and I'd have talk back and forth and I'd do dialogue and all that stuff and dialects it was a lot of fun but also like reading um and I um and listening to music I my room was my sanctuary as a child and I was very blessed that I was able to have my own room and and parents that respected my need to, to be able to be in a room by myself and, and, you know, do the things that I did. Uh, but I loved reading the world book encyclopedia. I would get an idea and I'd start researching it. This course was all before the internet was around and it was, it was a lot of fun, but I did like sports too. I wasn't constantly shut in all the time. I would go out and I had a really neat neighborhood I grew up in when I was a child. And I was kind of the organizer. I, we plan activities. We'd have football games and baseball games and basketball games. And we'd also build little forts out in the woods behind the house. And so we had a lot of fun there. And I had a lot of 
social contact with the friends that I had in the neighborhood, the other boys. So it was kind of a nice balance between the two. I really, you know, like I said, like being inside too and being by myself, right? And mm -hmm. using my imagination to entertain myself. Yeah. But I, I find a lot of HSP uh, people like to do that as well. So it must be something about our need to have quiet time and downtime from the world. But that, yeah, that was one of some of the things I like doing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing little Billy. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're quite welcome. Yeah. I think he's a little bit of him still inside of me. Yeah. 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 You never kind of get rid of that little kid inside. So yeah. Yeah, luckily. <laughs> yeah. yeah, truly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so no. And when did you realize that you are um um that, that you have that neutral innate trait uh of being the canary in the mine? Is that right? <laughs> Well, thank you. Because I think I think I think I think one of the main reasons, you know, we have high sensitivity as a characteristic and a trait is is just like Dr. Aaron says, we're here for a reason. Nature would not have provided for twenty percent of the population to have this trait if it was didn't have a purpose. And I think in a lot of ways we're all canaries in the coal mine in our own little ways, some bigger, some uh, some lesser. But nevertheless, we see things that other people don't see. We understand things other people don't understand just because of our characteristics. So yeah, I, yeah, I, I'm yeah, i just now really discovering that, you know, that, that, that trait that has been kind of suppressed my whole life, but uh, now it's starting to come out and I'm really liking it. It's wonderful yeah. to witness that, yeah. yeah. So picture this, you're standing in, in, a, in a coal mine and you're looking at um, three yellow canaries. Um, the alpha, the beta, and the omega. Do we need to add a fourth? No, I think that's good. Uh, which yellow canary will fly away first and why? Well, it depends on how, how you characterize the, the alpha. Um, the beta will probably stay. Okay, I would think they would stay. Their role is a little bit more supportive and would probably stay just to, because the other two are there. Um, but what I discovered in working on my book was that alphas are not quite like we think they are. In, in nature, they're more, they're more protective yeah. and they're more um, supportive of their unit, whatever is a pack or herd or whatever. So they tend to be more supportive as well even though they may give off the appearance of dominance and, and all these other things, maybe the strongest or whatever, they may stay as well to protect, right? And to, to do the things that alphas do. The Omega, I don't know. The Omega is probably the least happy of the, the three and probably would leave. You know, I would think it just would take off and leave. So, so that, that's, that's who I would pick. I would say that actually two of them would stay. Uh, the, the alpha and the beta and the omega would be the one to go. Yeah, yeah. And which one do you identify with the most? I think for a long time I probably would have identified with the beta, but now I'm starting to identify with the alpha. You know, and I think that has a lot to do with finding your calling in life and finding what it is you're supposed to do. Um, I've I've had some alpha characteristics my whole life, and I've also had some beta characteristics too. But I think really, truly, where I'm at at this place in time, I'm probably be more, leaning more towards the alpha. Yeah. So that, that's, that's what I would pick. Yeah, uh, sure. that's, I wanted to address that because it's such a, um, the sensing the subtle is so, um, it really is such a great skill. And we often forget that as high sensitive people that we can observe and uh, perceive and um, that we are so highly sensing uh, that we see what we are already doing in the world with this <laughs> amazing trait. You know, and I really think, uh, Suzanne, that, that that's probably something should be emphasized that should be emphasized more is the fact that the, what you just described is that we are highly sensing, 
And a lot of times people attach the word sensitive to things like being overly emotional or overreacting to things and, 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 and not, they kind of give it sort of pejorative meanings. But in reality, you're right. Highly being highly sensitive means being highly sensing. We can pick things up, and that is a wonderful gift that we have as sensitive people. Um, and we need to kind of be calling that out more. And I think we need to be sharing that more with people. Uh, the positive side, and it gets back to that evolutionary thing. That's probably the main gift we have is that ability to pick things up you know, being that canary in the coal mine. So yeah, highly sensing is a great way of putting it. And I think that would be something that men would embrace more likely than to say they're sensitive. Not that there's anything wrong with the word, but there's so many things that are attached to that for men that, that, that kind of pushes them back. So high, highly sensing is a good one. I, I like that term. Yeah, and... Um that's often where also our highly sensitive children are um, misjudged in a way in, in education yes. uh, because it's often misunderstood for ADD or ADHD. And um, yeah, it's, it's such a huge benefit if you can uh, be so confident to rely on that ability. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, like I said, I think that that's sort of like the, the external facing part of of uh, high sensitivity is that ability to pick up these nuanced pieces of information, right? It's not that we've got better eyes or ears or smell better or taste better or touch better than anybody else. It's just that our filters are a little bit more wide open and we pick up things. And then our brains having that capacity as, as it is uh, for sensitive people to do deep processing on things we take that data and we make something out of it. We see things, we maybe intuit things and maybe create things as a result of that, that yeah. information. So yeah, it, you know, that's, that's something that's really a gift. And um, I think we're, as, as more and more people are starting to talk about sensitivity and are, are talking together about sensitivity, that's one of those things I think we need to focus on. Cause I see a lot of people kind of, dealing with overwhelm and things like these are all important things and they're all part of being a sensitive person but let's not forget what we have here as a gift and that that that's something that needs to be taught and especially to young boys that are highly sensitive you're right it's so easy to misunderstand this um so getting them young and and educating them about what who they are and then letting them be okay with who they are and letting them know you're okay with them being who they are. That's really important. Yeah. Well, what was your um, definition of masculinity when you were younger? Well, I grew up in a part of the United States in the South, uh, the Southern United States, which was a, is, uh, an area where masculinity was defined in kind of classic Western hero terms, you know, strong, logical, unemotional, tough, you know, that kind of thing. So that was what I grew up with. And I was constantly presented with that all the time. You know, boys kind of, there's a, there's a man code and a boy code and the boys are supposed to be little men and other boys will enforce that code. If you get out of compliance, they do that by teasing you. They do that by shaming you. They do that by uh, berating you, whatever, to get you back in line to the boy code because they're all subject to being part of that boy code. And so growing up in the South, which is a probably the most traditional masculine area in the United States, um, that was tough growing up being different, knowing I was different. So what happened is you constantly, at least I did, and I know other sensitive men have had this issue, is constantly question, are you masculine enough? Are you man enough? You know, because you're not measuring up all the way up and down the board. So that's kind of what I grew up with. And um, it, I, 
probably in a lot of ways, because back then there was no Elaine Aaron's book and there was no understanding of sensitivity. I mean, I think uh, at least not at a wide level, um, people would say, you know, you're high strung or you're overly emotional or you're you know, too tightly wound or whatever. And that was what I lived with. That became part of my identity. And I thought that was a problem. So yeah, growing up in an area where they define masculinity in a very, very traditional way, Western traditional way, was what I was up against growing up. Yeah. And so what I did is I adapted myself to try to fit the mold, you know, even though innately I knew it wasn't me, you know, I was different. I had different sensibilities about things. And um, it was tough. But, you know, you did what you had to do to sort of survive. So I kind of did that. Um, and um, unfortunately, now I can look back on it and, and see how it changed decisions I made about, you know, anything from relationships to academic career to work life to choices that I made about partners and everything else, it really affected me. Um, and having had the, now the exposure to what sensitivity is, that's so liberating to realize that, yes, I'm different and it's really cool to be different because this is a great trait to have. And I wish I would have known that when I was younger. In fact, when I wrote the book that I wrote, I was kind of writing it to that little Billy you saw at the beginning of the, the interview. That was for him. And sort of an, it's an okay to be who you are. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I look at masculinity this way. I think masculinity can be whatever you want it to be. To, to truly, it's, it's a culturally defined term. I mean, from a biological perspective, you're, you know, you, you're born either a male or a female. In most cases, I guess, you're born male and female, right? And that's something that's biologically driven. But there's no set of genetic traits that says you have to be a certain way masculine or, or, or in a feminine way. And I like to look at this now as I kind of want to turn this around and say, we've had these cultural definitions of what men are supposed to be and what women are supposed to be. But a lot of those traits that fall into the female bucket or the male bucket are actually human traits. But they're just human traits, right? So instead of striving to be the masculine that I was taught to be growing up, maybe the, the goal should be to try to be more human. Because I do believe that within every single human, we, we going back to those pre-definitions, those definitions of masculine and feminine, we all have those qualities. Every man, woman, child has both feminine and masculine qualities about them. And I think we should be able to embrace them as human. So if we, if we see it, reframe it and say, this is a human quality. I want to be more of a complete human being. So I will be able to express my emotions. I'll be able to feel things. You know, we tend to look at nurturing and things like intuition and the, the power of emotion as being something that's a feminine quality. But for me, I think it's a, it's a superpower. I think you, every man should embrace it within themselves. So, Instead of seeing things in the masculine way, I think we should look at it as being what's human? What's the human trait here? And I want to be more human. And then, you know, you can't just walk out on the whole masculine feminine thing because it's so culturally ingrained. But the idea is that you don't have to live in a, in a boundary that's too tight for you. And I, I think, you know, men need to learn that and I'm not just talking about sensitive men, all men need to learn that they have a feminine side, which we traditionally call feminine. I'll just call it feminine energy, masculine energy, not necessarily something that's biology. Yeah. And we all have those characteristics, those traits, you know, and we should embrace them in us. If we have a very strong, what is traditionally called a feminine quality, then we should embrace that. It's part of who we are. And if we can let ourselves loose of those, those things, we can start including more people that are being excluded now, people who may not fit the mold 
of being masculine or feminine, but, but embrace them as human. And that's really my definition of where masculine and feminine should be going, in my opinion. Yeah, 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 I totally get that. <laughs> and we really need, they don't reflect the, our world we live in. They don't reflect the roles that men and women take these days. And I really think they need to be updated. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, especially when you see uh, those lines of um, uh, um, becoming a strong, sensitive boy. And then I think um, if a highly sensitive boy would read that, it would be so, it can, it can be damaging because then the sensitive boy has the idea that, um, that he is not strong the way he is. So I started this because when I work with my uh, male clients, I see how incredibly strong they are <laughs> um, in their uh, highly sensitive human being <laughs> package. Mm -hmm. it, really strong. And um, that's why I wanted to do this, to show uh, to uh, the people that there are various types of uh, sensitive men, just like there are various types of sensitive women. Correct. And that we, um, um, that when we, that, that we really need to pay attention to our communication when we see you need to become a strong. No, I think they are already strong. And now maybe take up more space uh, in the world to show um, not only to show, but to express your um, sensitive trait, because the world does need it. Yeah, I think that's really a very, very a good statement about sensitivity and strength. Um, I think, and I'm realizing this about myself, that I'm that, that emotionally stronger than I ever thought I was before. And I've gone through a lot of things, you know, weathered storms like we all do in life and um, have been able to navigate life because of the strength that I have inside. Um, it's a quiet strength. And I like to use the example, Suzanne, of, um, it's kind of like an Eastern philosophy, but if you look at say something hard and firm and something we see as strong, like a big rock that's sitting on the side of the, uh, right on a beach in the ocean, near the ocean. Uh, you, you could take a hammer and a chisel and you could whack away at it and chip away parts of the rock, but that's not going to really change and transform it. And, and we, yet we see the hammer and the chisel as being something that's really strong. But what about the water that washes across that every day, you know, from eternity to when it, from the beginning of time to now? And what happens is it gradually molds itself around the rock and shapes the rock and transforms the rock into something different because of the power, and the strength that water has which we don't see as something that's being strong necessarily, if you were gonna use them metaphorically, right? Yeah. So I think that's the kind of energy that sensitive people bring. It's a transformative strength that is gentle, but yet effective, right? You could take the, the chisel and the knife and hammer out at water, and it's not, you're not gonna do any damage to it, right? Uh, but the water itself has this enormous energy and strength to it that it's transformative. And I, I think that's what we possess. It's looking at strength from a different point of view, you know, and looking at it uh, in a way that really reflects the way highly sensitive people are, you know, generally speaking. And I think the water is a great metaphor for that, for that strength. Yes, well, thank you for providing that example. That's very really true. Yeah. yeah. So, in in that way, how can um, parents help our sensitive boys? Well, I think there's a lot of things that they can do. Um, it, it, it's funny you mentioned that because I just had written an article for uh, um, HSP Refuge about 
nine things they shouldn't do, which really, if you turn it around, is nine things they should do. And a lot of things we've already talked about. I, I think they probably the main buckets are, first of all, recognizing their sensitivity as a gift and making sure they understand that, making sure that they understand that if, even if, if they are different, you know, that there is, there is value in difference uh, in, in many levels. Um, and you should celebrate those differences with them, you know, and encourage them. Um, and recognize that they all have unique talents. But those talents, whether it's, whether it's uh, music or writing or it's academic or athletic or whatever, will be filtered through the lens of high sensitivity, which will, in my estimation, is that it, it intensifies the gift because you're seeing things so much differently. You're seeing things in a unique and creative way. So showing them that they've got a gift, plus they've got this gift of sensitivity as well. They definitely have to be emotionally supportive, you know, because it, studies have shown, I think we all know this, that sensitive people do the best in a supportive, nurturing environment. And they, parents need to do that. They need to be there uh, to be supportive for them. Yeah. Uh, that will create the best garden, if you will, for them to grow in if they, if they do that part of it. Um, they shouldn't question their masculinity. That's another thing we talked about a little a bit ago is that, you know, they're going to express themselves, especially the boys, in their own way and let them do that and, you know, let them uh, uh, be human first. I think that's the, 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 one of the main things. They've got to understand it's not a disorder right? It's not, you know, there's nothing wrong with your kid because they've got sensitivity and they've got to understand the child does that there's nothing wrong with them because of their sensitivity. And then finally, two other things, I think they need to give them space. So when they need a long time, downtime, when they're overwhelmed, they need space to recover, rest, refresh, rejuvenate themselves. And finally, I think this is one of the most important things of one thing that I wish I'd had more of as a child is they need to get to need to have gentle challenges, right? I, I'm not talking about, you know, like a lot of uh, uh, parents, maybe fathers, especially overdo it with their boys and like take them down to the deep end of the pool, throw them in and see if they sink or swim, you know, and that's not going to work with an HSP kid. But what you do need to do is make sure that they're getting challenges in their life, that they're growing, that they're expanding what's comfortable for them, and they don't get locked into some, into their fears. One of the things I think is important about challenges is that it allows you to externalize those fears, those things, those concerns, those worries. I can't do this. Or I'm, I'm not, you know, that's not something I can do because, and then they overthink and ruminate about doing something, and then they don't do it. The idea is to get out there and let them try things. And again, commensurate with their ability. So don't overtax them in any way like that, but they need to know that challenges produce growth opportunities for, for their, their boys. At the end of all of this is this idea that you have a confident young man who's confident in his abilities to grow, to meet challenges and to be who he is and be genuine and authentic. And I think those, those things, you know, are essential to getting a highly sensitive boy launched as a highly sensitive man. And we do need genuine, authentic, confident, highly sensitive men right now. I think more so than ever. Yeah. Yeah. Space to explore. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and um, we already talk about this, but what would you like to say to the sensitive male youth? Um, why it is important, especially now, to to embrace their sensitivity and to take up more space and just explore the world with their sensitivity. Well, at, at a, probably the most fundamental level, it's it's as we talked about earlier, it's an evolutionary quality. We're here for a reason. You have a purpose. Now, it may not be to change the world by yourself, but it, 
It might be to change the world in which you live, your neighborhood, your, your school, your, your, your uh, place of worship, or your community. You can do that. And you can be an example to other people and show them what kindness is, what empathy is, what, what um, being sensitive to what's going on around you. And I think more importantly, an awareness, right, of what's in the environment right now. A kind of thoughtful, cautious, advisory role that I think highly sensitive people um, can provide to the world. And, you know, their own personal ambition can determine how wide or far they want to go with it. Write a book or talk to people or share with other people, start a group of HSP males or females or just highly sensitive people. Whatever you do, you can be yourself as a sensitive person and make a change and model things. Our world is in a place right now that I am very concerned about. Um, having seen, lived 65 years, I have seen a, a lot of things that have happened in just the last 65 years. We're not heading in a direction, I think, that's sustainable. And I think it's something that we need to stand up to uh, and start calling out. And that's one of our roles, I think, as a highly sensitive people, is not only to be great in terms of creativity and being artistic and being thought leaders and great counselors and advisors and educators. We also need to help set the tone for where the world needs to evolve into. And I, I would say, you know, being born in this time and being a, a young man, that that's a noble goal. And it's a goal that, that has your purpose written all over it. You know, everybody will have an individual purpose, but an overarching purpose for highly sensitive people would be to, I think, spread those, those, those characteristics and those elements that are natural to us, that we take for granted. We don't even realize sometimes that we have them and share them with other people. Yeah. That's a wonderful perspective. Thank you so much for your support. <laughs> well, you're welcome. I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. It's very important to hear those different perspectives and, uh, uh, and also for parents and for uh, women to know how they can support our highly sensitive boys and men in the world. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Suzanne. It was great being here. <laughs> Thank you. I'm a highly sensitive man. <laughs>